the aims of the session really is to to challenge some of the myths about dementia care um, about people living with dementia about people um, living with dementia people caring for people with dementia and, and incontinent so often what i hear is always oh, dementia a symptom of incon or, or is incontinence a symptom of dementia um, people aren't clear and often don't get the advice and support that they could really do with um, if we go on the next slide please michael um, so this, the aim of this session is very much to think about some practical examples um, that I might be able to offer you. And, and if they, you've got any particular examples that you want to talk through, we, we can perhaps look at those. I can't tell you I'll have all the answers, um, but I will try my best to kind of give you some opportunity to think there might be some things you could try at home um, with either the person you're caring for or someone else that you are supporting. Um, and again, it's about promoting continence as well as managing incontinence, which is really, really important. Right, next slide, please. I feel a bit like Chris Whitty during the pandemic when I have to say that. So, you know, th there are some things that are, are, are very clear and that we know are true. So urinary and faecal incontinence, so that's both bladder and bowel incontinence, are more common in the older population. And there's lots of reasons for that. Um, so in terms of, um, as I said, the, the urinary and faecal incontinence are more common in older people. And we understand that there are lots of changes both in our body and our cognition that make that more likely as we get older. But it doesn't mean that it's inevitable. The link that we're talking about as well is that the biggest risk factor for developing dementia is increased age. So although we know there are other risk factors, the older people get, the more likely they are to develop dementia. So hence the two often go hand in hand, incontinence and dementia, because we've got those physical changes as well as those cognitive changes. But as I said, neither of those things are inevitable in older age. It's believed that we think that there are many more people living with both dementia and incontinence than we know about because often it's not spoken about. I have to say, as a dementia specialist nurse, it's something that wasn't taught to me in my early career to ask. And of course, it's something that I'm very interested in. So it's something that I do explore with people I support. But not all nurses, not all health and social care professionals broach the subject of incontinence. Um, maybe because they don't feel confident to, but equally, they may not think to ask. There's, of course, a lot of stigma surrounding both dementia and incontinence in some areas. And that can be a challenge for those of you who are supporting someone or, or living with um, dementia or having incontinence issues yourself in raising that with the health professionals, because you're not sure what the response is going to be, how helpful it's going to be. And people often feel very ashamed um, and embarrassed about the fact that they're having issues with continence. Um, I've seen it in my own family with, with family members as well as people that I have supported in my professional capacity. And sometimes it takes a little while to tease that out of someone that they are having issues. Often there's this perception that, well, I'm of a certain age, I've got certain conditions, there's nothing that any, anyone can do about it. So people try and, and just manage in silence and don't actually verbalise that there's a problem. Um, because again, often as people progress with their dementia um, trajectory, they may think that their incontinence is just a byproduct of dementia and it's a symptom of dementia. But I'm hoping we can kind of dig those misconceptions away a little bit this afternoon. Next slide, please. So the first myth I want to bust is the fact that incontinence is a symptom of dementia. So it's absolutely true that people might experience urinary and faecal incontinence with dementia. Um, but in the earlier to more moderate stages, it's unlikely to be solely caused by dementia from a physical perspective. So the cognitive impairment alone might not be the only problem. You know, people with dementia have other health problems, mobility problems um, and other challenges that may make it more likely that they have issues with continence, even things like medication. So it's really important that we don't make those assumptions. What is true is that the more that dementia progresses, particularly in those more advanced stages, it's more likely that someone will have um, 
experience fecal and, and urinary incontinence. But there are still things that we can do to support that person and to make sure that the impact of that continence is managed as best we can. One of the things that's really important to remember is people with dementia don't just have dementia as a rule. Most people who develop dementia have other health and um, health conditions, which may be impacting on their ability to remain continent, as may, as I've already mentioned, the, the, the medication that's prescribed for some of those conditions. So even from a very practical perspective, it's really important that we make sure that people are accessing the right assessments, medication reviews, all of those things that might be contributory factors that are easily remedied if someone is um, living with dementia and incontinence. Next slide, please. So there are lots of things that make people with dementia more prone to um, experiencing um, incontinence. And some of that is the, the problems associated with dementia. So people with dementia can have issues with mobility perhaps, um, and that can cause a challenge. And actually a lot of older people struggle with, with mobility issues and that can make issues with particularly urinary tract infections and things like that more common because they might be more reluctant to drink because they think if they drink, they've got to go to the bathroom, but because they can't mobilize, they can't get to the bathroom um, and so they choose not to drink and, and of course that has all sorts of health problems in itself. Um, so mobilisation can be a, a real issue. It could well be that someone has what we call functional challenges so actually from a medical perspective they don't have um, a, an issue that a medical problem or a physical problem that makes it more likely for them to be incontinent. It could be about the functional challenges that dementia poses. For example, being able to find the toilet. So, for example, in a lot of our homes, we might have a hallway with five or six different doors all of which look exactly the same. Um, it may be difficult for that individual to find out which one is the bathroom. It could well be that the person has sensory or visual perception problems, which means they may be uncomfortable with mobilising independently. So there's all these kind of factors that can, can act as barriers to someone um, who's living with dementia that add to that issue of, of um, being incontinent or struggling to manage their continence as opposed to a physical cause. It's also really important to remember that some of the other factors that um, uh, are likely to be linked into the misunderstandings of what caused um, dementia are things about the stigma. Um, also, you, we think about some of those really big issues that actually became much more apparent during the pandemic, actually, when a lot of public toilet facilities were closed um, and many haven't reopened. So again, if one struggles to manage your, your bowel or bladder, um, in a timely way, not being able to access public toilets can be incredibly challenging. Um, you know, I, I will talk about some opportunities to improve that later on for those of you on the call. It's also about the fact there are a lot of people in our systems who work in health and social care who may work with people or families affected by dementia who don't understand that there are some practical opportunities to minimise um, episodes of incontinence. I think one of the other big challenges is that we have limited suitable products or access to suitable products is actually the correct term. Um, if you don't have that expert support, if you've not had an assessment and you're just trying to manage it because you don't think there's anything you could do, it may be that you're not aware of the products that are available or what's most suitable for the person that you're caring for, but also for yourself. Um, because ultimately what we want to do is for people to maintain their dignity, their independence um, and put less pressure on their carers by being able to maintain their personal hygiene and continence matters for as long as possible and products can be really key in that. And, and sometimes we find that the products that are prescribed aren't quite right. They don't meet the needs of both the person living with dementia and the carer. And I think for myself, that's always a difficulty. I see that it's the person who is incontinent, perhaps, who is, is assessed for their needs in terms of what volume of fluid they pass, etc., rather than understanding what effect that incontinence has on the person who's caring for them as well. Next slide, please. And hence that kind of leads us to, to myth two, 
Um, I, I've heard many times, well, you know, why, why as a, a professional do I need to know? I, 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 you know, carers will know how to get access access to help and support and of course I'm pretty sure most of you will know that's not the case at all um, there is such a postcode lottery of post-diagnostic support for people living with dementia the families and carers across the UK and you know in some areas it's very very good it's very supportive it, it stays with you from just past the post-diagnosis right through in other areas it's very piecemeal people don't know where to get it if they get it at all and it might not be their need meet their full needs we're also really good as a health and social care system at looking at individual problems so we might look at you know if someone's got some mobility issues in one service if someone's got a diagnosis of dementia in another um, service and we don't really look holistically at the needs of the person and also their carers and how these things impact on each other so we often have treatment regimes and advice that kind of conflicts with other specialities that might be looking after the person and it's about looking at individuals in the whole and what's important to them and how we can manage that more effectively. Also, if no one's spoken to you about the likelihood of incontinence or the fact that if it happens, do ask for support, don't just accept it's the norm. Well, how do you know what's normal? How do you know what's to be expected? And I think that's really important because there are so many people who are living with incontinence who are, you know, just thinking it is it is what it is and we just have to deal with it rather than seeing if there are things that can be done both physically, medically and practically to reduce those incidences and actually make it less disrupted, less disruptive to a person's um, health and well-being. Um, because it's not just about the dignity and respect, it's about the impact on social life, on relationships, you know, extra washing, all of those things, you know, make a real difference to people's lives if we can eliminate some of that. And as I said, it, for many families, it may be a, a real taboo subject. In a relationship, it might be very difficult to broach it with your partner. If you're caring for a parent or a sibling or another a family member, again, it may be really difficult to raise this as a conversation. And I've certainly worked with a lot of families where they have known there's a problem, but they really don't know how to broach it with the person they're caring for, or the person who has got dementia doesn't want to broach it because they're they're embarrassed. Um, so it can be really, really challenging. And because of all the jiggled up services and provisions and pathways that we have and the lack of that sort of consistent approach to, to post-diagnostic support, sometimes it's about not knowing who do you ask. Do you ask your dementia specialist nurse? Do you ask a dementia support service? Do you ask your GP? Do you need a continence referral? And, and sometimes as a carer, hitting too many wrong doors and being told no we're not the person to, to help you but not getting any further direction can mean actually you almost give up to a degree um, and that's a real challenge in itself so it's about thinking well who, who do you need to ask if this happens and as I said before you know there's often this assumption that nothing can be done next slide please so you know, there's a huge reason why we need to challenge that myth and, and make sure that we make sure that people have the support they need, because there is so much of a negative impact on the poor support that is offered or not offered to family carers, particularly. You know, if you're not told about what might go on, you, you don't get the appropriate support and guidance. If you don't get the right assessment and um, filtered into the right service, it then means it's much more difficult to get an idea of what the appropriate aids might be to support those episodes of incontinence and to reduce them. Um, but also thinking about the practical advice and help, because sometimes we can't say we can eliminate continence. In fact, in many occasions we can't. But just by reducing it, it's really important that we try and reduce the impact as much as possible. One of the things that I think as well gets really overlooked is how incontinence can negatively impact on people's relationships, both their physical relationships, their emotional and social relationships, and the ability to be intimate. Um, and as, if that's impacted, then it has that knock on effect of people's emotional and psychological well-being. So it's not just about physical well-being and managing the incontinence. It's about 
what does that mean to that person, the people that care for them, and how is it impacting on their lives? And these are things that we often don't think about. We, we look at a very medical model approach and see incontinence, but don't actually see what happens to those people affected by it. Equally, I've seen in many cases, a lot of family carers say to me that, you know, being unable to manage a incontinence effectively is often the final straw in their caring journey and it's it's a point where a lot of people find it really hard to continue um, and some of that is because of the extra work that that creates um, and the frustrations and the challenges at a point when often carers are incredibly tired and and have, you know been caring for someone for quite some a considerable time Equally, it can reduce the risk of someone having to go into hospital, particularly if they have urinary tract infections, for example, or falls, all those other things that um, might be associated with, with managing one's personal hygiene. And often that means for many people living with dementia, if you go into hospital, particularly in the more advanced stages, it, it means it's more likely that the person might have to go into care. Um, and that's that's really challenging again for families. So what we want to try and do is stop us getting to this point and think about actually what can we do to change it but equally understanding and planning ahead so if this is a problem that is going to be the tipping point for you as a carer how to take that forward so it doesn't get into a crisis point and any control is taken out of your hands similarly if we don't get the right assessments and support there's a negative financial impact um, I see so many family carers who say, you know, I've bought all these products, they don't work, you know, and so they go out and try buy more. And it may well be that the, the person with dementia is, is entitled to products as part of a care package. You know, they may, they may not, but actually without that assessment of understanding what products are available and, and what they cost and all those sorts of things, how will you know? Um, and of course, alongside that is the increased workload. Um, if someone is incontinent, there is all that washing, there is all that bedding to change, clothing to change, you know, carpets to clean. Um, and hence, you can start to see where this becomes a real catalyst for people to say, enough is enough, I can't do this anymore. So, you know, it, it's about making sure we can try and enable people to, to make those choices in a timely way. Next slide, please. I want, I want to kind of think about the myth that nothing can be done. We've I've touched on that a couple of times um, and I was working with a gentleman, we'll call him Joseph, that's not his real name, and he was a gentleman that I've been working with quite some time. Um, he'd been diagnosed with vascular dementia, he also had some other health problems, but was, was relatively active, living at home with his wife um, who cared for him beautifully, they had a wonderful relationship. Um, but he had started to urinate in the bedroom at night, often waking up in the night and going to the corner of the room and, and passing urine. Um, and on occasion, it would be by the bedside. And his wife was distraught. She didn't know how to broach it with him. Uh, on the occasions that he did sort of mention, or she did try and mention it to him, Joseph became quite angry, quite distressed. So she, she chose not to, to talk about it anymore. Um, and so she did open up to me about it and we start to have a look about, well, well, where was this happening? Because actually during the day, Joseph was continent. He was able to take himself independently to the toilet, use the toilet appropriately. Um, there weren't any concerns at all, but this was happening at night. So we thought about what might be appropriate to try and find out what might be causing the problems. And I had a chat with Joseph and I, I, you know, I probably as a nurse got away with a little bit more than his wife did. And I didn't sort of say that his wife had had been um, telling me about it. I just said to him, you know, Joseph, sometimes at night time, people can get a bit disorientated and struggle to get to the toilet. Is that a problem that you've been having? And he went, mm, not really. Um, but as we spoke more, he goes, well, now and again, he said, but you know, it is what it is. He said, but to be honest, I think there's someone else doing it. I don't think it's me. So we start to have this conversation. And I said to him, well, how about we put a commode by the bed um, so that you could use that if you got out or a bottle? And he was horrified by that. So we parked that conversation for a little while and I explored it further. And 
I'd known him for a long time. I knew that he used to live in an old terraced house with a, a toilet at the bottom of the garden. So I said to him, you know, when you used to have the toilet at the bottom of the garden in, you know, years ago, what did you do? He said, oh, I used to have a jerry can under the bed. I said, well, do you want a jerry can? Would that help? And he went, well, yeah, I suppose so. And the other thing we did was we put some soft night lights in the room because one of the other challenges for him was that he had some issues with visual perception problems. So, of course, getting up at night, he wasn't able to orientate himself either cognitively or, or visually. So he was going to the corner of the room and sometimes the wardrobe thinking that he was getting to the toilet. But with the soft night lighting and the the jerry can or the old fashioned chamber pot as we call it under the bed it made it more likely that he would use something that was familiar to him so we tried this for several nights and actually it worked and and so it didn't I couldn't say to you it was a hundred percent of the time but ninety percent of the time it it was um, a, a lot better opportunity for him to actually pass you inappropriately in, in the pot but that was only part of the story because for his wife, what it meant is that she was sleeping better because obviously whilst this has been going on, she'd been sleeping with one eye open waiting for him to get up. Um, but equally, she felt more comfortable in remaining in their, their their double bed together because she'd got to the point where she said, I can't sleep with him anymore. You know, this is this is really uncomfortable. So not just by doing something very simple and practical, um, you know, we were able to make all those changes um, to that person's outcome. So I think, you know, that's not going to work for everyone, but that might be an opportunity to just think outside the box, I guess, and think, well, maybe something can be done. So you'll see here there's a there's a whole range of things that might be going on. So it might be that they spend a lot of time in the toilet. Um, we might it might be that they're more reluctant to eat and drink because again talking about that worried about having making mistakes or getting to the bathroom. Um, I've had lots of cases where ladies might use sanitary towels um, even though they're postmenopausal and not menstruating um, because they, they, they're aware that they have an issue but are not really comfortable with having a conversation about it or not able to use the right products. It may be that someone's getting up frequently during the night. Um, I had a, a case, well it, it can happen during the day, I had a lady who was during Covid, she moved in with her daughter so she was living independently in, in her own place um, and her daughter had noticed that there'd been quite a lot of soiled washing, but not really wet, just, you know, just moist. Um, but her mum did all that herself, sorted it all out. She came to live with her daughter during COVID and the, the daughter was recognising that she was going into the bathroom sort of every 15, 20 minutes. Um, and part of that was because her mum was anxious that she didn't want to wet herself. So she kept going to the bathroom. But it turned out that she was actually passing urine every time. And she said, something's not right here. And her mum was only in the sort of the early stages of dementia um, and very able and very aware. And they had a conversation about it and, and I, they came through to me. And um, basically this lady was taking a lot of what we call diuretic medication, which is medication which is to flush fluid out of your body for people who have heart failure. Um, and she'd been prescribed a lot of medication for a period of time when she was very unwell, which should have been tailored off and it wasn't. So this poor lady was um, battling this this medication, which she no longer needed. And hence it was making her go to the toilet, you know, constantly. Um, we got the medication changed and um, I went round to see them not long after COVID and she was thrilled. She said, you'll never believe it, Zena. I can go two and a half hours without, without visiting a bathroom now. And I thought, how life changing that must be, you know, particularly if you want to go out and about and you're not having to worry about going to the bathroom. So, you know, again, it's about not assuming it's a dementia. It's all about the, the medication. But anyway, I, I digress. I often do. Um, but what made me think about that was, she, you know, she didn't want to go out. She didn't want to go out because she was frightened to go out and that she wouldn't find a toilet. It could be that people, particularly if they're having issues with their bowels, for example, um, you may see that they've got real discomfort. Um, they may start to use natural remedies. It could be that they're experiencing constipation that they try and manage independently. And then that causes faecal incontinence because they haven't quite got the remedies right, things like that.
um, and also being restless and anxious because of course it's it, it's really anxiety provoking and you might notice little things like you know stains on the furniture or, or soil patches at, at, on seating it could be that you know, people have discreetly tried to take off undergarments and hide them somewhere because, you know, that they're, they're not sure they don't want to disclose it. And of course, it may be that someone's personal hygiene changes and, and you notice that, you know, that some more smells in the bathroom or, or in the personal um, hygiene as well is affected. So, you know, these are things that aren't always so obvious. They can be quite subtle, particularly those um, first sort of uh, signs. Um, so it's about trying to sort of piece the jigsaw together. Next slide, please. So really, once you start to think about seeing some of these or, you know, you notice that they're becoming more problematic, it's about where do you go? How do you get some help? Or what can you try? You know, what can you try while you're waiting for some support? So if we go on to the next slide, um, there's some things to consider there. So, you know, what is new? Is, is it a new problem? Has something changed? Because we all have different bladder and bowel routines. And I'm not going to ask you to disclose yours, you'll be pleased to hear, as I won't disclose mine. But, you know, what's normal for one person is not necessarily normal for another. So we don't compare each other, but it's knowing what is normal for that person. And actually, is this something new? You know, ha has this been going on for a while? You know, has there been some slight warning signs or, or is this something very acute because it could be that for example if someone's got a urinary tract infection it makes it much more difficult for them to remain continent when they get that urgency and irritation that might you know make it more difficult if they've got any um, sort of medical or physical conditions could that play a part in it you know as a woman of a certain age, you know, women, older women have had children. They still have gynecological problems. It could be something that is, you know, physical. It could be that they have a medical condition that means they've got an overactive bladder, for example. Same with gentlemen. There could be issues around their anatomy and med medical conditions. So all of those things need to be explored. And we mustn't be thinking just because someone's got dementia that that will be the cause. Again, constipation can be difficult to pick up, particularly if people are still independent and in going to the bathroom because you may not be aware when they last opened their bowels. But certainly constipation can cause difficulties with of not only bowel um, movement, but with bladders and, and um, urinary um, uh urinating so you know it's really important if you can get a sense of what's the normal pattern of, of bowel movement for that individual often communications affected when people um, live with dementia so again does the person know how to communicate their needs I've seen a lot of people who get really distressed and quite agitated um, and and lo and behold you'll get a lot of professionals go oh you know that that that's a behavioral symptom of dementia often a lot of behavior is very much about a person trying to um, verbalize an unmet need something that they might not be able to find the words for or communicate so you know I think to myself how mu how distressing must it be if you you really want to go to the toilet you don't know where the bathroom is and you, you can't tell anyone um, so again you know people might become a little bit agitated maybe even aggressive because they're frightened so you know again trying to steer them to the right but you know thinking about behavior as a sign of communication might be really helpful it might be just about regular prompting um again because someone might forget or they might need that extra time to actually mobilize to the bathroom medication i talk a lot about and and i won't go into detail but there are medications that can stimulate the bladder in a way that means it's much more difficult for people to remain continent and as people have lots of medical conditions those things can be more apparent so regular medication reviews um, is really really important um, and, and if you are seeing that someone's having some of these symptoms it may be that, that that's a little bit of a nudge to mention that to a doctor or a pharmacist if, if that's who you see to to review your medication and see if anything needs changing. Um, again, if someone is having issues with incontinence, it could mean that their skin integrity is, is, is challenged. So obviously, if people have urine or feces on their skin for any length of time in a way that they wouldn't normally, and perhaps their, their personal care is not as good as it, it could be, that could mean that their skin is, is, is in um, compromised. So you might want to think about, do they need some support with personal care? And that doesn't necessarily mean 
that that has to be you. It may be that that's the point to think about perhaps other carers coming into the home to support with personal care. That would be a very personal um, discussion to have. And again, thinking about diet, are there if people live alone, sometimes we find that they struggle to do their meal preparation adequately, so they don't eat as well as they could. So that has an impact on their bladder and bowels. They may forget to eat and drink reg regularly. So it may be that actually just some regular support with shopping and meal preparation can aid their, their issues with their bowel and bladder. And so, again, it might be the time to think about do they need a social care support? Do you need a carer's assessment? Um, all of those things are really, really critical. So, again, seeing it's part of that bigger picture. Next slide, please. And here's some more practical things. One of the things. Oh, that's really weird. My iPhone just spoke to me. Apologies for that chipping in. <laughs> um, but it may be that does the person have issues with coordination and dexterity? It could be that buttons, for example, are quite difficult. Um, studs on on um, trousers, zips, they may be more difficult for someone to manage. So that might be why they're struggling more with incontinence. So even things like maybe um, elasticated waists or something like that might be useful in enabling that person to, to remain more continent. Again, thinking about the mobility, does that person have pain when they mobilise? You know, do that is their pain, if their pain were better managed, would they be able to mobilise more readily? Um, and do they have the correct mobility aids? Pain management in people living with dementia is so underreported and, and, and underdeveloped. And, and it's really important that we think about, you know, as our get, joints get older and a bit more wear and tear, it can be more challenging. So if people's pains managed, it might make it that much easier for them. Practical applications, you know, is has an occupational therapist been around to see whether, you know, toilet raises, commodes, all those sorts of things, are they helpful? Is, is a urine bottle by the bed going to be more helpful for a gentleman? All those kind of things. And coming back to, to your um, signage, you know, signs on the door are really, really good. So people know where the toilet is, where the bar bedroom is, where they can go and have a shower. They really help people navigate the space, particularly when as I said sometimes it all looks the same um, I always think when you go into a premier room or some of those hotels you know you go down the corridor there's a really chaotic carpet and all the doors look the same it's, there's nothing to you know other than numbers when you get there to kind of pick it out so it's really important to kind of put yourself in, in people's shoes sometimes and think what might be helpful colour is, is a good thing as well. So people may lose their um, visuospatial issue. Uh, they might experience visuospatial issues or issues with visual impairment more broadly. And so often bathrooms and, and shower rooms are often very pale in, and those colours are quite difficult for people to be able to pick out a toilet, for example. So there's lots of evidence that suggests like a, a brightly coloured toilet seat preferably in a primary colour such as red or blue or even if it's black compared to the white can be quite visible so someone might be able to see the toilet more readily um, and, and certainly you know that that's we did that in a hospital ward that I worked with and it really helped people um, identify where the toilet was so they weren't being incontinent or passing urine etc on the floor. Lighting again, just very soft lighting, just to be able to navigate around, particularly at night, is really helpful. Um, and also just being able to move around. Um, rugs in the middle of the room might appear to be holes, for example, if someone's got visuospatial issues. So they might not want to get up because the flooring, you know, looks like they might fall. In, they might see that there's a threshold there, for example. Or is it just that they're very anxious because people with dementia don't just have dementia. They might be anxious. They might have issues with the mood. So maybe that going to the toilet lots, it, it could be very much related to being anxious as well. So lots to consider. But primarily, it's, it's also important that you recognise your own needs in this is, you know, think about how it's impacting on you as a carer. How are you coping with it? Have you had a carer's assessment recently? And I'm sure there are things you're aware of, but absolutely, you know, make sure that you you regularly get the assessments that you need. Um, and do you need information and advice? If there aren't appropriate resources um, 
on the shop floor, so to speak, in your local area. Think about organisations such as Dementia UK who have an Admiral Nurse Dementia Helpline available. So you can call, that's open seven days a week from nine in the morning till nine at night, um, Monday to Friday, and I think it's nine till five Saturdays and Sunday. And I think the only day of the year they shut is, is on Christmas Day. So again, you could talk through your own personal experience with that um, nurse who would perhaps be able to look at it in a very one-to-one -one way and give you some practical tips and advice. If it's affecting you going out, have you got a radar key? Now, radar keys are readily available. Um, they are keys that enable people to use disabled toilets. And often because dementia is a hidden disability, people might not think to suggest that. Um, uh, but you can certainly um, purchase them, get them from councils. They're only about two or three pounds. It means that if you're out and about, you can use disabled toilets. Um, and if it's getting to the point where you need personal care, you know, do have a conversation with a social worker or someone, a support worker of some sort, to decide whether it's the time is right to have extra support come in um, to help you with that, because it can be difficult when managing relationships whether that be as I said spousal parents siblings you know providing personal care particularly when continence is an issue can be really really challenging so it's really important that you look after your own needs 